Good afternoon. It's Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening. Hope everybody had a great weekend, a great four-day weekend for a lot of people. Some people took Friday off, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And so it's good to see everybody here Tuesday evening. Um, we're our 16th study in the book of Mark. Uh, we are in Mark chapter 5. We've already gone through four chapters, which is exciting. And today we're going to talk about the uh, demoniac that Jesus meets on the uh, east side of the Sea of Galilee in the Gadarenes. Remember, a lot of people have heard the story of the Legion. A couple of points I want to look at is about his mind as in contrast to the mind of the world. And even a little contrast to Adam and Eve that I thought was interesting is more we look at this. But um, anyway, if you have your Bible, open to Mark chapter 5 and uh, let's begin. We know that Jesus is in, has been in Capernaum at the north tip of the Sea of Galilee uh, teaching and preaching. And he was growing in fame and popularity. Uh, at one point, he's walking on the shore. The next point, he's in a boat. And then the next point, uh, the, he has to get in a boat and push out from the shore because so many people were surrounding him. So his popularity is growing. Uh, the, 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 his reputation is increasing. People are starting to see his power, understanding that he has authority. Children are still trying to understand who he is. And the powers that be that see him as a threat uh, want to kill him. So that's Mark 3, verse 6. So let's take a peek at this. He's in the boat. He's been teaching all day. And uh, he, uh, he, he, they went across the lake. This is Mark chapter 5, verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Uh, Matthew, I think, says Gadarenes. But same region, just on the, yeah, the east side of uh, the lake, uh, Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, same place, but on the other side. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man, now you'll notice here differently that, that Mark and Luke, there's three accounts of this. There's uh, Mark 5, Matthew 8, and Luke 8 all talk about the same incident. Now, Math, Mark and Luke agree that there was one man, and Matthew says there was two, so I don't think that that's anything to get controversial about. Um, as, as some of you know, if you've taken a report or if you were a police officer, you know that there are many angles from which the witnesses see things. Maybe Matthew wanted to be more precise. So he said, by the way, there was two. And I look at this as a parent that for years, if there was two, we have two children, that one dominated the other for for a couple of years where the other one didn't even speak, but the other one did. So my daughter always spoke for my son, and he we didn't think he was ever going to talk because she did all his talking for him. So you can see how this is possible, that there was maybe one dominant man that meets him from the tombs. He comes out to meet Jesus. And so when Jesus got out of the boat, now he's out of the boat, he steps onto the shore. It says, a man with an evil spirit. Of course, Matthew will say two men came out of the tombs. A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. I don't find that hard to believe, by the way. If you've ever been with somebody that was uh, demon-possessed, which I have not personally seen that. I've seen video of it. I've heard of pastors dealing with people who are demon-possessed. Or even um, people can come become demon-possessed. Uh, I had a friend named Martin who was a Satan worshiper who when they took drugs, they became very strong to the point where when they would put handcuffs on them, they could break them, just pull them right apart like they were nothing. So I can see where uh, the strength uh, of a demon could be in that person. Maybe maybe there's drugs back. I don't know. I mean, that would be speculation. But certainly it says that they couldn't bind him anymore, not even with a chain, because he would break it. So he was very powerful. And by the way, demons are powerful. Let's not mess with demons. Let's not play with demons now, you can look at the seven sons of Sceva and, and Acts, and they got beat up and went screaming away naked because the demon whipped all of them. So, for he had often been chained, so they had tried to chain him, hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. Even no one was strong enough to subdue him, but here comes the king of kings and lord of lords. And this man in his, in his own flesh knows he wants to be delivered of these demons. They occupy him. They possess him. They've destroyed his life. And so you know that the only angle and the only aim that the demons and Satan have for you, even though they entice us with beautiful things and riches and fame and people sell their souls. I mean, 
uh, who said that, um, Beyonce said that, uh, Rihanna said that, um, Katy Perry has said that, I sold my soul, they've all confessed to sell their soul to the devil. And I even think one of them named their demon Sasha when they get on stage that it fills them to give them the ability to entertain. Now, you know, I'm not anybody's judge, but it appears that, you know, you can be possessed if you allow yourself to become possessed and these demons will take over you. But their only aim is to destroy your life. You are the image of God created biblically in the image of God or after the, his likeness through the seed of of Adam, so to speak. We look as God wanted us to look with his intentions and with his purposes. And the devil just wants to destroy that by any means necessary. So this man is possessed with demons. He's chained. He has a family. You'll read in one of the accounts, he has a family. And so he's separated from his family. Isn't that just like the devil and people that are on drugs and people that are doing things that the family may or may not approve of? They're separated. What does God want? He wants you to be together with your family and the devil will do anything to separate you from the herd and destroy you. And so this man separated. He, he'd often been chained hand and foot. He tore the chains off. He broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him night and day among the tombs and in the hills. He would cry and cut himself. By the way, Leviticus 19, I think it's 19, 28 says, don't cut yourself. Now, I think there's a, a problem today that I've even witnessed that uh, there are some kids that our children have gone to school with that do cutting. They cut themselves, and, and sometimes people don't know why, and maybe it's demonic, maybe not. Chemical imbalance. I'm not a physician. I don't know, but it's interesting that even back then he was cutting himself, uh, and it's recorded. <clears throat> so he would cry out. He would cut himself. My belief would be that he's under this influence so strongly that the torture of his mind and body is overwhelming. So he's screaming and crying and cutting, and he wants out of this uh, unholy relationship that's occupying his, his body. It's a spiritual warfare. You know, we don't battle against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6. We battle against principalities and rulers of darkness. And so here's a man, prime example. He's got war with his heart, war with his soul, war in his mind with this, this demonic occupation. So he sees Jesus from a distance. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him and shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me? Jesus, son of the most high God. Now, <clears throat> it is very common if you've ever studied demonology for demons to take over a person's voice. It happened with Peter. Remember when Peter said, you're not going to the cross Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. The devil did all he good, could to prevent Jesus from going to the cross. He did it in Matthew 4, Luke 4, and tried to through Peter. The demons can use your voice. They can make you sing. They can make you speak. It is often thought, if you've ever read anything about the, the, the Nazis back under World War II under Hitler, that Hitler would speak in the meetings with one voice and speak to the crowds in another, and they felt that he was demonically possessed. So, yes, can demons use your vocal cords? Absolutely. So, uh, the man fell on his knees, and they acknowledge. Remember, these demons have a history with Jesus in heaven prior to the fall, prior to them being cast out of heaven in Revelation 13. And so, they know who Jesus is. They can identify him very quickly because they have an eternal, uh, or eternal history prior to time with Jesus Christ. And so, son of the most high God, they identify him, swear to God that you won't torture me. Now, he's speaking through the man. This is a false thing. God is, Jesus Christ is not going to do anything to this man. So, they're using the man as like a shield. Oh, don't hurt this man. Well, he, they, they know Jesus ain't going to do that. And Jesus would not do that. He's coming for them. So, swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked the demon, what is your name? And I had a friend, uh, Mike, that spoke to a demon uh, in a man. That guy uh, fell on the floor, slithered like a snake, and tried to grab the pastor's throat. And the, the, the demon spoke through this man and said, I want to get you, but I can't. And by the way, that's true. You cannot be touched by a demon if you claim the blood of Jesus Christ and do not allow them. To get you they cannot touch you without God's permission and you'll see that here you'll see that in Job chapter 1 
Uh, God limits the powers of these demons. They submit to his power. They fear him, they know him, and he has power over them. Jesus Christ says, and if you're a child of God, you do too in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't leave yourself open to demonic possession. Avoid it at all costs. And um, so this demon speaks. What is your name? My name is Legion. This is almost a braggatory um, tone that this demon would have. There's 6,000 of us or more, basically. He replied, for we are many. And then he begged Jesus again and again. This is what the demons do. They cower at the power of Jesus Christ. All these people worshiping Satan, all these people that put, want to put satanic monuments up anywhere, centers of town, next to crosses, the demons tremble. They have no power. God is not threatened at a demonic statue or at the presence of uh, demonic things. They are trembling when they see Jesus Christ. And when you come in the power of the Holy Spirit, you are untouchable as far as Jesus Christ. And I could give you a vision I had when I was younger, uh, and this was just last year, the only vision I've ever had in my life, and it was about demons. But um, And I can say they could not touch me because Jesus wouldn't let them. So he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding in the nearby hillside, and the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And look at this key verse. In, in Mark 4, 13, Jesus gave them permission. Uh, the devil had to get permission to tempt Job. No one can touch you unless you allow it. And I'm going to look at, you can look at Romans 1 and Psalm 1, the two things we can compare here in a minute. So he gave them permission, and only after he gave them permission were the demons and the evil spirits able to come out, and they went into the pigs. The herd was about 2,000 in number. They rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and they were drowned. That's interesting because if anybody knows pigs, they can swim. So why did they drown? I don't know. Fear. Um, they could see the demons. A lot of times people will say a dog or a cat can smell or see it, uh, demonic forces. I can tell you that there's been times when, when I was a trooper that uh, dogs act pretty weird around some pretty some people. And they, it's that they, they think they can smell demonic presence. And I would say that that's probably very accurate. They can smell it and see it before you can. Um <clears throat> because of the power of the dog's noses and senses. So the herd was about 2,000. They rushed down this deep bank into the lake and were drowned, which I felt was interesting because pigs can swim. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to see Jesus, they saw the men who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there. And this is interesting. If you have your Bible and you write in your Bible, I would circle this, and I did. Sitting there... I circled that or just put a parenthesis around this part, sitting there dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Well, they didn't recognize the guy. Wait a minute. This is the guy we've been chaining. This is the guy that's been howling at the moon. The guy that's been running around partially naked. The guy that we've chained. The guy that's been cutting himself. Wait a minute. Who is this guy? And this is what happened. Remember when they came across the Sea of Galilee and Jesus said, say, Opa Pepe Moso to the, to the um, hurricane and it calmed. The, 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 the disciples weren't like, wow, way to go. They were more fearful of Christ at that time because he commanded the storm to go away. They were more fearful of him because of his power than they were of the storm. And so here's the same thing. They're more fearful of Christ than they were of this man because they're like, who is this man who has authority over demons? And Jesus Christ is that man. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Now I wanted to say there's something interesting here that I like, that I think you can compare. That the man who cried out to Jesus is clothed and in his right mind. The people that don't care what Jesus does, they're in disarray. They're fearful. They've, they've lost their herds. And I, and I can't blame them for that in their humanity. But they're like, Jesus, you got to go. And this is what I said, we could compare Romans 1 and, and Psalm 1, which makes uh, a comparison, if you look at it. First of all, um, he's clothed. In Isaiah 61.10, when you come to Jesus Christ, and if you read Luke 15, which is the parable of the prodigal son, what does the father do? When the son returns, he runs out and throws a robe on him. 
In Isaiah 61.10, it says that God puts his robe of righteousness on each one of us. So this is almost symbolic in that the man is there clothed and in his right mind. So he's thinking now with God. And quite honestly, only people who honestly are surrendered to Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, not full of ego, not for any other purpose, but to worship God and are humble in the Spirit, think with their proper mind. And then in Romans 1, it gives us an issue, or, or a, um, and, uh, Romans 1 talks about the mind of people who don't want Christ. And so if you look at Romans chapter 1 to compare the two minds here, the demoniac who's been healed and has the mind of Christ now, and the people that are trying to reject Jesus and throw him out, they are not in the right mind. They're fearful. It says that, um, number one, in Romans 1, in verse uh, 22, it says, People claim to be wise, but they become fools. Why? Because they exchange the glory of a mortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart. So they're exchanging God for anything but God. I want to worship, whether it's sports, whether it's power, whether it's fame. I don't want you, God. And he says, okay, if you don't want me, I honor your free volition. I honor your free choice. Then go ahead. You can have what you want. And it says God gave them over. And you go a little further. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Uh, and worship and serve things that were created rather than the creator. And it says that because of this, number two, this is the second time, God gave them over. He gave them over, paradidomi. He, they were given over uh, to sin, to darkness, and to judgment. There was, you know, just evil all around them, and they wanted it. So I was or looked up these words, by the way. Um, number one is people suppress truth and the first time. And verse 22 says they're suppressing truth. They're pushing it down. They're cataconning the truth, holding it, suppressing it. They know it's true. They don't want any part of it. And that happens today. I know God is true. I know God exists. I don't want it. I push him away. I'm suppressing the truth that I have in my own very heart and mind. Uh, Neil deGrasse, deGrasse Tyson would be one of those persons that suppresses the truth. He argues against the word of God. And he suppresses the truth. So therefore, he has a, a mind that doesn't work properly. And so God gave them over. Paradidomi to, uh, gave over to judgment um, because they suppressed the truth. Open the sewer of sin. Isn't that interesting? If you reject God long enough, he'll give you over to your sin, to what you want, what we want. And then he gives you over. He'll open the sewer of sin to you if that's what you want. And let us go into the darkness of our desires, if that's so. If that's what we want. He's not going to force himself on us. God gave us a choice. Whosoever will may come. If you don't want him, he'll let you go. If you go to hell, he'll let you go. It's your decision. God doesn't want that. He wants all men to get saved. But he's not going to force himself on us. And so he, people suppress the truth. Therefore, God gave them over to judgment to the sewer of sin. And then it says that um, because of this, God gave them over to the point where uh, people were even women and Jane, excuse me, exchanged natural relations for unnatural uh, relations. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women or were inflamed with lust for one another. It was a perversion. They were given over to perversion. This is what they wanted. We want no rules on our sex. We want to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it. And most people in the world are like, well, if that's what you want, go ahead. God says the same thing. I don't want that for you. It's not my best design for you. But if you want to be given over to perverted sex or to perverted minds, uh, they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge. They suppressed the knowledge of science, which is what they're rejecting, just things that are natural. They're going for unnatural, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. That's an adikaimos mind, adikaimos mind, because it's a sick mind, and it's unable to pass the test or operate as God intended it to operate. So three times, God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. They don't want to think with God. If you don't want to think with God, well, then this is the result of you not thinking with God. And it says here, that after they had their depraved mind, after people rejected God so long, 
Um, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness. And there's a list here in Romans chapter 1, the end of the chapter, of everything. Not only are they evil, not only are they enjoying their evil, you know, falsely, because the devil's going to let them because he wants to destroy them. They're, they were God-haters, insolent, arrogant. They even invented evil ways of doing things. They disobeyed their parents and so on. So that's one mind. But this guy's in his right mind. So those are the people that reject Christ. That's this world today. If you're not thinking with God, you are thinking incorrectly. So um, go to Psalm chapter 1. And what is this guy's mind? He's in his correct mind, in his right mind. He's now thinking for the first time with God. He's clothed. He's clothed as a Christian would be in righteousness. He's got a robe of righteousness. He's in his right mind. And here it is, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We have to be free thinkers, critical thinkers. I think with the word of God. My frame of reference is the word of God, nor stands in the way of sinners. I'm not going to stand there. I'm not listening to the ungodly. I'm not going to stand in the pathway of sinners and consider compromising my right mind. I'm going to think with God. And that's what that means. Does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. This is a person in their right mind. This would be the man standing before Jesus now in Mark 5. He does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly. He does not stand in the pathway of sinners any longer. He wants more of Jesus. So he's in his right mind. He's not going to compromise. He's not negotiating with the devil any longer. And that's what happens. With, just look at any movie star. Not all, but there are many who have said, I negotiated with the devil. I sold my soul to the devil for fame. And it's, on, it's recorded. So you can look at it yourself. So they're negotiating with the devil. They're walking in the counsel of the ungodly. And then there's some that sit in the seat of the scornful. So he doesn't sit there either. He's not sitting there judging. He's not pointing the finger at other people. He's not trying to throw down God's creation and go after him and ridicule them and sit in the seat of judgment. He's no longer chained by judgment, no longer chained by um, legalism. That's the word I was thinking of. Legalism. This man's been set free. He's no longer chained. He's in his right mind. He's walking with God. He's thinking with God. He's standing with God. And his, that says here, then in your right mind, your delight, Psalm chapter one, verse two, your delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Do you want to have a right mind? Meditate on the word of God day and night. So you can compare Romans 1 and Psalm 1. Romans 1 is a debased mind. It's an adikaimos mind. And in, in Psalm 1, you have a right mind, a mind that thinks the way God has intended human beings to think. Not standing waiting to compromise. Not trying to negotiate with the devil. Not weighing the good and the bad. Always focusing on the good. And the law of God, and that doesn't mean you'll be perfect every time. That doesn't make you right. You'll make right decisions all the time. We're going to make mistakes. That's what grace is all about. Grace is the opportunity to try to do something correctly. You make a mistake. You don't fall into judgment. You fall into grace, and God restores you back to where you were. It's forgiven, forgotten, and gone forever with the right intentions. It happens. Stuff happens. So here's this man. He's in his right mind. He was naked. Um, Adam and Eve were naked in the Garden of Eden, by the way, and God clothed them. And here's this man naked in this garden of stone, for, for lack of a term. It's a tombstone. It's a graveyard. And now he's clothed and in his right mind. So, yeah, I was just looking, and this is the lesson for today, basically, that um, here's a man, a demoniac. It shows that Jesus, once again, has authority over demons. Not only that, though, for anybody who wants to come to God, I'm confused. I can't think right, Rob. I'm struggling. Go to the Word of God. Ask God to correct your mind and start thinking with God. Psalm 1, stink, uh, thinking with God. Um, so I think that's it. I just like the one thing is remember, the demons cannot touch a believer without God's permission. Demons petition Christ. Let us. They have to submit to his decision. They know he has authority and they're under it. The demons and the devil are under the authority of Christ. Even Satan in Job chapter 1 has to ask permission to tempt Job. And then it says in this instance, for example, please don't throw us into hell. Please don't judge us before our time, son of God almighty. Um, and he gave the demons permission and they did not leave or wander off. 
or defy because they cannot defy his authority. He said once they gave, once Jesus gave the demons permission, then they could leave. And that's the way it works. So if you're having struggle with demonics, if you're having a struggle in your mind, come to Christ Jesus. Declare the blood of Christ. Uh, start reading your Bible. Go to church and pray. That's the three things I always say to everybody. Read your Bible. Pray. Go to church. And God will help your mind, help heal your mind. And uh, you can start to think with Christ in a proper mind. If you don't do that, read Romans chapter 1. And it shows you that you'll have judgment all around you, paradidema. You'll have an adikimos mind, a mind that can't operate the way it's. And you're going to suppress truth. When you suppress truth, you're given over to judgment, and your mind will never function properly. But in Christ Jesus, if we pray and read and meditate on his word, we can think properly with the mind of Christ, with our Bible being the frame of reference for everything that we do. And isn't it great, the Bible? Don't murder, don't kill, don't steal, don't... What do we got to worry about? Love your neighbor, love God? What a great book. What a great book to be able to think with God. So, anyway, I hope everybody has a great day. That's lesson number uh, 16, Mark chapter 5, and we'll continue tomorrow. Have a great night.